Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. As always, Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I are joined by former Navy SEAL Michael Higgs. Since retiring from a long military career, Michael has worked as the Director of Programs at the Honor Foundation, a unique transition institute created to help members of the U.S. Special Operations community realize their maximum potential during and after their elite service careers. He has also served as Director of Operations at The Mission Within. This is a six-week entheogenic psychospiritual therapy program focused primarily on Special Operations Forces veterans, combat veterans, first responders, and contact sports athletes who suffer from treatment-resistant and complex conditions such as TBI, post-traumatic stress, depression, or addiction. We talk about a lot of different things today with Michael. We talk about his personal healing journey with psychedelics, his approach as a preparation and integration coach, the unique challenges military members and veterans face when seeking help for trauma and moral injury, the importance and power of self-love and forgiveness, and of course, much, much more. If you're looking for good training and education pursuant to becoming a psychedelic therapist, check out Numinous's training programs. You can click the link in the show notes or go directly to numinous.com forward slash hour dash training dash selection and use the code PTF10 for 10% off selected trainings. You've heard Reed and myself mention our work with psychedelic clinical trials a lot on the show. We do have a number of clinical trials actively recruiting participants. So if you or someone you know might be interested, you can click on the link in the show notes, or you can go directly to numinous.com forward slash research to learn more. And as always, if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by leaving us a review and or rating in places like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And now I give you our conversation with Michael Higgs. Welcome everybody back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Reed and myself are honored to be joined by Michael Higgs today. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing good, brother. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Of course. Really grateful for you setting some time aside in your busy schedule to talk to us and our audience. Um, why don't we start just by having you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Michael Higgs. I'm a 30-year Navy SEAL, uh, stationed both coasts, Virginia Beach and San Diego. Uh, I retired back in 2016 out of San Diego. Uh, you know, 30 years in, I had 10 years pre-war and then 20 years during, during the, the combat. Uh, retired 2016, worked in the private sector for a bit and consulting, went back to the federal sector. And now I'm the program director for the Honor Foundation, uh, which is a special operations transition program here in San Diego. Uh, then I also work um, in the psychedelic medicine space uh, as a coach, as an advocate, as, a, as <clears throat> excuse me, and as a uh, facilitator. Awesome. Yeah. And I was, we were talking before we hit record, um, how you came across my radar, Michael, uh, my brother had sent you a, sent me a LinkedIn post that you made. Um, and I was just, I ended up watching another interview that you had on Mark Devine's podcast and was just really impressed with the work you're doing for our veteran population. Um, many of our listeners will know that uh, I started my psychology career in, in the United States Air Force. And, um, as an Air Force psychologist, I, I developed a humble appreciation for the unique kinds of struggles that many of our military members face and then are kind of left in a lurch, many of them, when they leave the military, whether retirement or separation or medical retirement. Um, and we haven't had anybody on the show yet to really talk specifically to this uh, these unique challenges. So really excited to dive into it with you today. I get to be first. Yeah. And on, on that note, uh, um, well, thank you for being here. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that struggle that Steve's alluding to, if you could maybe shine a bit of a light on it. I recently watched the movie. It was on an airplane um, coming home from a trip recently. The Covenant, Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. Have you seen that by chance? I have not seen it. Okay. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it has a really interesting... A depiction of combat related PTSD symptoms. And um, yeah, I thought as a treating psychiatrist and having worked with a lot of different kinds of PTSD, but having never been in the military myself, uh, I was just struck by uh, what happens when people come home sometimes. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit the unique PTSD struggle of combat related trauma. Yeah, happy to. You know, um... And I'll, and I'll speak to complex traumas, too, because I, I think a lot of us, you know, there's, there's trauma stacking 
uh, that happens for a lot of us, whether it came from childhood, early life, uh, current life, and then, you know, what happens, True. you know, coming back from combat. Um, you know, when I was, de I was deployed, you know, some, a lot of the missions, a lot of the deployments weren't heavy combat, and, and then a lot were. But then there's all, all there's also the training aspect of it, blast injuries that happen all the time, and we're not as operators and soldiers and you know service members we're not too uh, smart about protecting ourselves from blast injuries. Sometimes, sometimes we think it's really fun, um, but there's a cumulative effect that happens as well, right? So probably around twenty, I'll say twenty two thousand and six. I started to suffer some really heavy, serious cognitive, uh, cog decline, I'll call it. Um, you know, and then coming back from the war, there's just a lot of heavy mood swings. You know, I was coming back from a really negative environment uh, back home, not really enough time to kind of wind down and, and reintegrate back home. Uh, at the same time, I had some struggles going on in my own personal life. My, my wife had got injured um, in an accident, a uh, bicycle accident, got addicted to Oxycontin. Um, and then shortly after that, my uh, oldest daughter got addicted as well from a, um, a sexual trauma and then back and forth to the war zone. So I, I found myself probably over almost 10 years just bouncing I, what I like to describe as into, into two different combat zones. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'd leave the arena overseas and I come right, right back home into another chaotic event and then escape that event to go back into combat um, at the same time dealing with my own personal struggles. You know, trying to keep my head on right, <laughs> um, masking a bunch of injuries that were going on with me, trying to keep my job so I could still, you know, support my family and basically just basically uh, keeping the wheels on the bus. Right. Um, I retired back in 2016. And when I did, I thought like I actually escaped everything. I was like, yeah, I win. I get the prize. <laughs> um, and it was kind of funny because I was actually on a speaking tour for a little bit, speaking on resilience. Uh, but at the same time I was on that tour, I noticed that I was really starting to fall apart. Um, things were starting to catch up with me. I was working with some other SEAL buddies of mine that were suffering through their own traumatic events, which somehow kick-started mine. <laughs> it's like misery loves company, it, it felt like at the time. And very quickly, within a, a, cu a couple months, six actually, um, I went from hero to zero and became suicidal. Um, I kind of stacked that up with all the other stuff I had going on. So I had, you know, childhood traumas going on that were coming back to me as flashback. I had overseas traumas that were coming back to me um, as flashbacks. I was having impulse and rage controls. I was getting very violent. Um, I'd gotten a DUI <laughs> at 50 years old. Um, and I was just very quickly spiraling. Um, I was on a heavy, heavy med reg regimen from the VA with psychotropics and pain meds and, you know, sleep concoctions and everything else. So I just had this really beautiful or non-beautiful caustic cocktail going on at the same time, uh, which luckily I was able to escape. Um, I escaped it through psychedelics. Uh, the intent when I first went into the medicine was to help a buddy of mine. Uh, but I went down as his, as his teammate uh, to help him. And, and I, is just the same as he did. I got my life back uh, in, in a period of three days, which after 10, 15 years of psychotherapy and, and being on a, a heavy regime of meds from, uh, from the VA and from the Navy, uh, I found that quite amazing and happy to share. Yeah, I want to dive into that here soon, but I also just want to highlight that um, what you're describing here, Michael, is I think tragically common in a lot of our military members, right? Where... They come into the military already with trauma on board, a lot of it childhood stuff. And they experience, um, you know, whether, whether or not it's physical injury, although I think a lot of people who get blown up and get those cognitive, those, you know, TBIs, um, it's not exactly visible to the naked eye, but, you know, it certainly exacerbates PTSD, makes things harder. Uh, there are a lot of folks who will then compare themselves, their battle buddies who do sustain physical injuries, and maybe they don't feel like they are entitled to the suffering that they're experiencing. And it's really isolating, right? It can, you can feel very alone in this. And I've, I've seen that pattern where, you know, people come home to the chaos and they almost crave the more controllable, predictable chaos of the battle environment where they have a team, where they have camaraderie, and it feels almost more doable. And so you'll see people rushing back to the theater of war as an escape. 
Um, yeah, but if, if you'd be willing to talk a bit about your psychedelic journey, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, and I'm glad you said about uh, the aspect of escaping one combat zone back to the other because it, it was a common thread. Everyone felt that they could, you know, going back overseas to Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else in the Middle East was very much more controllable to them than what was going on at home. Um, so my, my psychedelic experience was, was pretty unique to me. One, I had no psychedelic experience going into the medicine whatsoever. I didn't, I didn't drink much as a kid. I, I didn't smoke, you know, THC or cannabis as a, as a kid or a student. Uh, so this was all completely new to me. I had heard about the medicines. Um, I had seen a bunch of other SEAL friends of mine that were in really bad shape somehow pop back into my life in a really beautiful place. And to me, that was pretty astonishing and it was pretty um, encouraging, but I never dove into it past that. I was like, hey, what are you doing? Um, so when I ran into other friends that I saw kind of going down a bad path, I'd always refer to them to those people. But I wasn't really putting much stock or much research into it myself. So when my time came, I had reached out to two different uh, entities, one another SEAL uh, teammate of mine. Marcus Capone, who had gone down uh, to Mexico and gone through the same treatment I did, had come back and it's like, hey, I'm going to start a foundation and, and fund guys and girls to go through this medicine. Uh, and then I reached out to the doctor himself, Dr. Martin Polanco, uh, who was running the mission within or does run the mission within, uh, who had got into the medicine. Really, his background was trying to help his sister, who was an addict, um, and got into it with standing up clinics to treat addictions in Mexico. Uh, Abigail specifically has been used throughout Mexico to treat addictions. It's, it's, I, it's not really a wonder drug, but if you compare it to what we get from uh, the current system that we have with rehab, you're talking a 70, 80 percent success rate versus a 20, 25 percent success rate. Um, but, but what Martina done, he kind of stumbled on the fact that as as other operators or other service members had come down with addictions, on one half, they also had complex traumas and, and, and PTS and TBIs that the medicine was able to alleviate a lot of those, if not all those symptoms. So that kind of spread very quickly, word of mouth. Uh, and we almost had our own little underground clinic, I, I guess you could say, going on for a long time. Uh, so when I went down, I went down with five other veterans, uh, four SEALs and two other uh, service members. Uh, we had all gone through... Um, preparation coaching with a therapist prior to, and then gone down together. Uh, the, the medicine itself was medically supervised. Uh, there's a doctor down there. There's a nursing staff that's down there. Uh, and it was very, very well organized machine. It wasn't what I had in my head had pictured. I wasn't sure what I had pictured in my head, but it was entirely different. Um, and it was a beautiful setting. It wasn't a clinical setting. You know, it's this very loving house. It was very warm and very inviting. And, and everyone there was just a, a beautiful, warming, inviting individual. And, you know, I, I think I had expected to see lab coats and fluorescent lights and, you know, the hospital setting, correct? Um, wasn't the case. Uh, we had gotten down there. We ended up sitting in circle a long time. Everyone kind of sharing their story, which was the first time I'd ever sat in circle and shared anything with anybody. Uh, without a beer in my, a beer in my hand and, and jokes flying back and forth. Uh, and it was powerful. So, you know, in sharing my story when I was down there, if, if not one, there were two other individuals with almost the same story. Uh, and you go through life thinking you're the only one, you know, in your, in your own private Idaho. And actually, you know, there's a bunch of guys or girls around you with the same story with just maybe a different unique twist to it. Uh, so that was super encouraging and it just invited you know, more sharing to take place. Uh, I found it even more ironic that I'm sitting here with SEALs that I'd operated with, that I'd fought with, and I had no clue was in their background, and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> so we did a lot of integration, uh, pre-medicine integration, and then we did a small ceremony, setting our attentions and talking about, you know, what we wanted to invite into our lives, you know, what we'd like to see in the medicine or maybe experience, and then really what we were trying to get rid of. Uh, then we went upstairs, we took our medicine, it was in pill form. So Abigail, the isolate itself is uh, just an extract isolate from a boga. <clears throat> so they gave it to us in pill form. And I remember all of us sitting there in a circle just staring at this bowl. It seemed like for two hours, <laughs> waiting to see if we're going to take this pill or not. And then we went upstairs and got hooked up to you know all the monitoring devices that they have. Mostly to monitor your heart rate and your heart condition, your breathing. 
and just waited and waited and waited and waited. And uh, it seemed like we all waited forever until finally the medicine you know, set in. Uh, my experience with Abigail and, you know, all everyone's individual experience with, you know, psychedelic medicines is, is unique to them. There's a lot of commonalities, but some are drastically different. Mine was a, a dream that I got to be, take part in, to sit in. Uh, I basically got to go relive, relive my entire life and be a witness to it. I got to sit with it. I got to talk with it. Um, I got to see a lot of things play out. And for me, the way that I, I like to describe it to some people uh, in the SEAL teams, we use this um, targeting program called Palantir. So it's, it's a link diagram uh, targeting system. So if I want to get to bad guy X, I can map out a way to get to him through these different cutouts and, and people and organizations and stuff like that. And Abigail like played out my entire life just like that. So it gave me a lot of linkages, cause and effect. I could go forwards. I was going backwards. I was going into other people's lives and then back to our intersection where we had met and then got to work through all that and move forward for a good 13 hours. Um, when I came out of the medicine, I had felt like someone had put a vacuum cleaner to my head, like it was still. It was extremely quiet. It was calming. It wasn't scary. And then I just cried for a long time and then hugged myself. And then I wanted to charter an airplane and fly around and forgive a million people and 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 forgive myself and, and carpet bomb the world <laughs> with what, what I had just been exposed to. Um, it was just an extremely overwhelming and very uh, it's hard to describe it because the journey wasn't peaceful you know, there was a lot of ugliness in there there was a lot of darkness in there there was a lot of love but just the fact that I was able to reconcile throughout that was worth everything else in my life it was just a beautiful experience um, that's amazing um, yeah. that's so touching to hear um, and so this time is this the time when you went with a buddy, like you did it for your buddy and you both did Ibogaine, uh, went to a, a, a center that could help you with that. And, right. um, and what you, something you said jumped out at me, the, uh, you wanted to forgive yourself and everyone else. And um, wondering, I'm, I'm really personally intrigued by the role of, forgiveness in our healing journey and what that can like let go of in terms of the stuff that holds us back and wondering what that was like for you. What kind of forgiveness are we talking about? How'd you do that? Did you really get a jet and fly around and, and dish I out wish. forgiveness? I <laughs> wish. Um, that was, is that, you know, guilt and shame are probably the most, you know, immobilizing mm -hmm. emotions we can have. Right. And they just trap us. And, and I had been trapped with it for years, you know, even coming off deployments or even in my relationships or in my childhood. And, you know, I, I like to describe it to people as having a stake in your foot and you're just going in circles. You can't escape it unless you pull it out yourself. Um, and I was able to do that. And I was able to see where I was at fault in a lot of things and how that played out. But I was actually able to forgive myself in, in the medicine and, and give myself, you know, some compassion and love. That was a new thing. Uh, there was a new emotion to me. And one that I struggled with, I think, even post-medicine, I was like, am I worthy of this, right? Am I worthy of, one, other people's love, but am I worthy of loving myself, right? And then how do I really do that? And so that was a, a long journey of, of playing with that and just learning how to fall into that. I would very quickly, even, you know, today catch myself if, if I get into a negative feedback loop or a negative thought pattern, I catch it so quickly. I'm like, hey, man, we're not going there. You know, what's, uh, yeah. what's RuPaul say? Not, not today, Satan, right? I'm like, no, we're not uh -huh. going there, man. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's what I've noticed as well, personally, in doing this work is, like you said, you've got to feel all the feelings still. And all the unfelt feelings to a certain extent, which is hard, but, but it's not that you don't get derailed or, um, you know, fall back to asleep in moments or, or get, uh, you know, um, self-critical and guilt and shame and all that. It's that we, we know the path to get out of it sooner and not even, 
going back to these medicines necessarily, but the practices daily that help us get out of there. And, and uh, yeah, like your personal experience really kind of sums up how, how I've been looking at it. Like first we got to feel all these feelings. We got to forgive ourselves because there's in trauma, there's a narrative of self blame and, uh, and it can be really protective, right? Understandably. But, uh, and then you set it, you set it free on the wings of forgiveness, uh, like both for self and others. And it's so liberating, but so anyway, thank you for sharing that. No, thank you. I think that's the that's, that's the big one, Reed, is, is it's one of the, the acceptance, right? That you're allowed to feel love, right? And to, mm-hmm. to love yourself. But then it's it's recognizing that, hey, it may be one step forward, two step back. It may be two step forward, one, one step back, because we're so self-critical, right? And then, you know, myself coming from, you know, the SEAL teams, it's an extremely high performance environment. There's like no forgiveness for anything. Oh, <laughs> there was oh, no yeah. forgiveness for yourself. There was no forgiveness for your peers. And it was dog eat dog, and it's it's dog dog eats himself, and it was it's just really crazy. So to to come out of the medicine with that feeling of compassion, for, you know, for myself and for other people, um, and then to really see, you know, a lot of like, hey, we're all in this mixing bowl together. Uh, it just changed my entire viewpoint on everyone. You know, I used to. You know, look at people, you know, addicts and, and people, you know, in whatever stage of life, if they weren't like me, they were wrong. Uh, and, and now it's just a completely different outlook. Yeah, because we kind of we grow up for whatever reason, sometimes being taught that forgiveness is weak, you know, but, you know, it's really like not only wise, but one of the most important medicines. I, I like how uh, Tara Brock, uh, psychotherapist, Buddhist uh, mindfulness teacher talks about it as the trance of unworthiness that we can wake up from with judgment, shame, self blame, and then the forgiving self and others. These two wings of forgiveness is how we let go of those chains, and then we can actually reconnect to the world. So I'm glad you brought up that part of the equation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm especially glad because you know I think about the the mindset that you're referring to that that a typical uh, sort of hardened military veteran or, or a special operator in particular has this, this sort of fuel that they burn to help them operate at a high level. And it's kind of dirty fuel sometimes. It's like an internal coal plant and, as opposed to this, the clean nuclear power of self-love. I'm wondering, what would you tell, you know, a veteran or somebody listening to you, this, uh, you know, special operator talking about hugging himself and self-love uh, who might feel a bit skeptical? How might you talk to them? It's a funny dialogue, right? So when I came back um, from my medicine journey, I was still working with the SEAL teams, actually as a civilian director at the time. And I remember I would like, leave this beautiful space of healing and love, but then I would go back into the hate locker. Right? Like everyone in my office was just so filled with hate yeah, uh, for whatever they were hating. And I was like, God, I just want to hug these guys. Like, how do I talk to them? Um and I couldn't because if I did, I was going to come off as an evangelist, right? And, mm. uh, just chase people away from me. And what I realized slowly over time was just I just had to walk my own walk and, and, and attract people to where I was by trying to chase them and grab them. Um, but I had, to, I had to change. I had to change my demeanor. I had to change my verbiage. Um, a lot of my actions and my reactions were the big one. Um, and then slowly over time, I, I started to re- find people that I could talk to. We'd have really loving conversations about it, but it wasn't commonplace. It's not the stuff you talk about in the team room, right? Yeah. Um, so I found myself at a weird intersection for a long period of time, like this, these two divergent paths and these two divergent groups of people. Like, how do I bring them all back to center? Um, and I'm still doing that to this day. So I always just say it's the right person, the right time, and the right place. And we bring them back slowly. We bring them back, but we can't force people into that dialogue. I really like where you've landed with this. You know, it, it, it's the way I think about it is you're, you're living the change instead of evangelizing the change, like you're saying. And uh, people notice, right? right. Uh, op- special operators are, if, if nothing, they are observant, right? They're, they're paying attention. So uh, to live that change is also an invitation, it sounds like. Yeah. And I, you know, when I started this, I was talking about all those other guys, you know, that I had seen, you know, in very negative lives and, you know, 
traumatic events happen to them. And next thing you know, they're walking around flip flops and flowers in their hair and they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, what do you do? But I, you know, I never was curious enough to ask, but then it never went away. They stayed the same uh, in that same positive light. And that sucked me in, you know, post-medicine. I really sought those guys out like, Hey, what have you been doing? And it's like, is it the same as what I did? And uh, what are you doing now? You know, and how are you implementing this into your life and how are you sharing it? So then I end up having like these two distinct groups of friends. I call it my left of medicine friends and my right of medicine friends. I love that. You know, you, you talked about um, the, the Ibogaine experience, right? The Iboga experience. And I've, I've heard it described by many uh, in similar ways that it tends to be this, this life review. Um, and Reed, you can tell me if, if, if you think differently, but I think that might be fairly particular to Ibogaine. Certainly people have those experiences in other medicines, but it seems to be one of the really um, healing properties that people see their lives uh, almost like a slideshow very, very clearly. Um, so yeah, it's just a comment I wanted to, to highlight because it seems like a really interesting and, and helpful aspect of that particular medicine. Yeah, I've heard that heard that a lot as a common theme, but wondering what what you've witnessed in other people sounds like besides your your buddy, there are probably countless others who you've uh, informed about these tools. And I'm wondering if you've if you've seen that show up in uh, as a pattern as well or from a lot of other people, the life review that Steve's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I've sat now probably with a good 300 plus you know, guys and girls in medicine cool. um, and in different medicines too, outside of Abigail. So psilocybin, ayahuasca, a um, bunch of different variants as well. Um, Abigail to me has pretty much been the one that's shown you that lifeline, you know, that, that, that life view. Uh, but it's not consistent with everybody. You know, if, uh, one of my buddies just floated in, in outer space in complete darkness for hours. Um, didn't know what to cut to make of that. You know, he felt love, but mm. he didn't know what to do with it because all by himself uh, floating in space. Some people had a really negative view. You know, the, it, the medicine uncovers a lot. Um, you know, we, we always tell people not trying to make too much sense of it too soon because it will unfold. Yeah. Um, so, and then a lot of people would come, come down and have not done the work or the prep work, the preparation, um, and maybe became a little bit too emergent. And weren't prepared for what they were going to see. And it was really hard for them to integrate. <clears throat> but Abigail specifically for me, way more so than ayahuasca or psilocybin, has is, is been a very linear um, journey for me where ayahuasca and psilocybin sometimes are just all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, given your experience with with uh, those three medicines and others, um, I'm curious what you think of this. I, I remember after my first ayahuasca experience several years ago, which was, which was amazing. And I have not yet still personally experienced Ibogaine as much as I would like to. But uh, I remember reading, uh, going down a rabbit hole of sorts of how to characterize, how to describe these ineffable things. And it was actually a Reddit thread where um, one comment uh, jumped out at me where someone was saying ayahuasca, in their opinion, helps you move stuck emotions more as a general theme versus Ibogaine helps you see your patterns. Uh, I'm wondering how that lands for you. No, I, I actually view it exactly like you just said it. Um, you know, I've had a, you know, a couple other traumatic events, you know, will pass my medicine journey where I feel that when I felt that I was getting in a, in a stuck point uh, and I wasn't moving through it with therapy, it just couldn't seem to get to the X. I like to call it. Um, psilocybin or ayahuasca has been the one that I go to, to, kind of move that rock um, and let me kind of get out of my own way. I may not get the same downloads sometimes, or sometimes I get way more downloads than I expected. Um, but a big, um, I call it just my release of energy. Like, like if I can't expel mm. it myself, um, I'm still alive, but in ayahuasca, I've actually been able to just allow me to have that grace and just shed that and move forward. Yeah. That's really cool. And and is there a way that you like to describe any differences between psilocybin and ayahuasca and these kind of um, general themes? Yeah. So they call Abigail the grandfather, 
right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and ayahuasca is the grandmother, and, and psilocybin I like to call agnostic. So it's always not non-gender based. Um, it takes on, I think, what you kind of give to it. It's a very, for me, it's a very calm medicine. It's a very calm journey, uh, depending upon how you go into it. Uh, I remember I was talking to one of my buddies. He came down one time. I was out at the reservation here in Southern California with my Indian friends. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm just going to take this mess. I'm just going to crush it. And I'm like, you know, be careful of the energy that you're going to bring into this because uh, you're going to get what you put into it, right? You're going to get what you show up with. And, yeah. he, you know, he, he got given what he, he got given, he, he got what he needed uh, to show, to allow himself to see that. That crush it mentality, I imagine, is pretty typical, right, in mm-hmm. military members. And I'm wondering, you know, you're a, a preparation coach. You sit with people in the medicine. You're an integration coach. What are some things that uh, you like to talk about in preparation and integration that you think is particularly helpful for this population of a human being? You know, just, you know, the word vulnerability is just this strange foreign word, you know, to vet, to veterans in general and maybe those that work more in, in, in the kinetic side of things. Uh, I used to laugh because I spent all my, my time doing all these um, target vulnerability assessments. So how do I take this target down? How do I get access to it? How do I, how do I find the weak points in it and exploit it? And now, and now you're telling me to be vulnerable, right? <laughs> so I can be exploited. Uh, and so I have to really work a long time, you know, with, with my, my friends, my clients, my peers, like, how do we shift the, shift the thinking of that word? And what are we going to get from being vulnerable? Um, and then the other word that has always had a negative connotation is surrender. Right? Like, oh, yeah. how, how do you reconcile with that word? And then and we don't even know what it means. And even when we think we're surrendering, we're still fighting. Um, and really walking through that and just, you know, you always hear trust the process, but there's so much trust that has to go into diving into you know, to a medicine journey um, and slowly, you know, getting to that stage where everything's really starting to come on, where the medicine sets in how to breathe through it, you know, how to allow yourself to just be at peace and just accept. And we talk a lot about curiosity, like just be curious in there, you know, have fun, um, ask questions. <clears throat> um, and then if you see the, the dark side of things coming on, you get to choose whether you're going to go into that dark room or not. Right. And be okay with that decision. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's one of the big ones that comes out. It's a really interesting point on surrender um, because it does have those other connotations. It is interpreted as giving up sometimes or admitting defeat or, or viewed outside of this space as weakness. But I'm wondering when you prepare people or work with people, especially with a military background, do you use that word and reconfigure it or do you use other terms or how do you get people on board with this, like what's really, I think we all agree is a key concept. <laughs> I just try and keep using the word in, diff- in different scenarios and, and walk them through it. Like what does vulnerability mean to you? You know, what does surrender mean to you? Um, and take that back to, you know, the bare bones of how they described it and kind of work forward from that. Um, I think that's the hardest one. Yeah, and even if you yeah. do all the work prior to, once you get to medicine, it's like whatever, all the work you did, somehow just goes in one ear and out the other and and uh and you might revert back to you know putting your dukes up and fighting again that's a hard one i was in a uh went to an ayahuasca retreat uh several years ago that was organized by some uh former navy seals by um by navy seals for their friend it was the most touching thing like like you were describing in your ibogaine experience and um and what struck me is uh what some of the people there struggled the most with was just staying on the mat like needing to go do something or like take control of the situation in some way um and like sitting with it was was the hardest part on that first night, practically speaking, um, which was, it was really, uh, it was really interesting. And it's, it's very hard work. Like, you know, I don't want to take away from that. It is the probably the hardest intention and one of the most important ones. Yeah. I think s- sitting still and sitting in silence. Right. Um, but then the other thing is, you know, you, you see your teammate or your friend suffering or, 
our automatic response is to divert from myself and go help he or she, right? But that takes away from them doing their own work and it allows me escape from doing my work, right? Uh, so we speak a lot, of, a lot about that too. You know, if you hear someone suffering, it's like, hey, they're, they're doing the work they need to do. You need to, you know, stay on the mat and, and, and work, work with yourself. Yeah, there seems to be some really specific and important preparation um, think, topics to cover for uh, for our military pop population. I'm thinking of sort of the military doctrine of shoot, move, communicate, and that that doesn't really like vibe well <laughs> with, with a psychedelic experience. Um, so you know, it's a bit probably a bit of an uphill battle to help adequately prepare folks like this for a medicine experience. It is and it isn't because what I found is by the time that they decide to come and step into the medicine space, they're ready for the change. They're, mm -hmm. Whatever they're doing is not working for them. Um, so they're more apt to receive and hear things differently and be a little bit more ac accepting to it. They're still going to battle it you know, a little bit. You, it's hard to get past those, you know, all the conditioning that's, t that's taken place over time. Mm -hmm. But they're in a well more um, or a way more um, accepting and vulnerable space than they have been. And for, for a lot of us, myself included at the time, it was, it was, I felt it was just my last ditch. Right. Mm -hmm. and if this doesn't work, if this doesn't work, screw it. I just, I just won't be here tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the story of a lot of folks who are in the VA system, people who've tried everything, all the medicines you were describing, all the therapy, uh, and then they've tried alcohol, you know, they've tried, I don't know, kite surfing, like adre <laughs> adrenaline stuff. They're often at their, their sort of wits end when they find right. this particular work. Yeah, you're always trying to replace, you know, I think we go through life trying to replace one thing with another thing, right? So yeah. if I'm smoking, I'm going to find something else to put in my hands. If I stop drinking, I'm going to do something else. It's always it's always another form of addiction, you know, so how do we find moderation? And a buddy said something to me one day. He goes, everything in moderation except for moderation. <laughs> it really uh, stuck with me and I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. We're We're masters at behavior swapping and the art of like missed direction, redirection and, and anything but staying with turning towards discomfort. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense, but we don't always see it uh, as we get pulled into these patterns. But um, you know, what's interesting when you first said the term targeted vulnerability assessment, I thought just in my psychiatry brain, I thought you were talking about like a a psychological intake or evaluation or something. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can see how, like, we don't want to find and exploit vulnerability targets. That's not the right term in humans. But but uh, to find those entry points of vulnerability is an interesting thing to think about. Like you were saying, sitting in a room sharing without a beer in hand uh, for the first time ever, that really struck me. It's, you know, it's, it's hard. And, you know, my other job, you know, I work here at the Honor Foundation in San Diego. Um, our whole first phase of our program is built around like peeling back the onion and getting the guys and girls back to being human again, well before we even talk about transitioning and transition skills. Yeah. So last night, you know, this, this week we've had story night for two nights in a row. Mm. Um, and there's some deep stories that come out and sometimes they're shallow, <clears throat> but what we found is the stories that come out are the stories that need to come out at that time. Um, and everyone has a story and a lot of, a lot of us have been holding on to them for a very long time and just need the right time, space or container to you know, actually speak it. Um, and sometimes the med or most of the time the medicine can, medicine can really, you know, accelerate that. Um, yeah. Cause you never know, you know, how long that's you've hold, how long you've held onto that story when it's going to become too much and take, you know, take a different turn than, than it needs to. Yeah, they do need to, they do need to come out or we need to connect with each other in, in some way. Um, I'm thinking of like the power of group uh, journeys in general, and also looking at programs like AA, like the success of AA, I've always thought in, in large part comes from that, that uh, vulnerable community that shares with one another and takes care of one another, right? And and that sounds like what you're describing as well in in these uh, in these storytelling and opening up, which which isn't easy to do, but it's so liberating and therapeutic when we when we take that risk. Well, I think it, it you know when you get in that circle or whatever whatever shape that may take, 
you finally realize that you're all in there pretty much for the same reason, right? Uh, there may be some voyeurs in there, but for the most part, there's everyone in there is, is ready to get after and get and get to work. Um, and there's power in that. And it doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't need, even need to be said. It's just felt. And then it just happens. Yeah. There's a special magic to, like you said, telling your story, but having your story be witnessed and accepted and validated by people who have experienced some of the same things you've experienced, right? right? When we have that community that Reed's talking about, you know, it does a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to healing and psychedelics might be, might grease the skids. They might provide a unblocking, like you said. Um, but I think it's especially important in the integration conversation, right? We talked a bit about how you prepare people. What kinds of things do you talk to your folks about um, when it comes to integration? The big one is, is, is recognition, right? Is, uh, and my wife's a therapist and a, and a, and an integration coach as well. And she has a phenomenal job at this is like one, you know, we suffer in silence, but we heal in community. So it's really welcoming in community and seeking out community um, <clears throat> and finding those like-minded people. But the other one is, is recognizing when you start to have those negative feedback loops and those negative thoughts. And I like to describe it as I'm building in response time by reaction time. Um, so I felt for the most part throughout my entire life, I was just fast roping into target. So fast roping into target means as soon as you hit the ground, you got to get after it. So there's not much you can do, but react to everything. Um, and when I talk about response time is like, Hey, if, if, if I insert further away from the target, then I have a lot more time to really let this thing develop, right. And see it for what it is. But then using that time and time over again, is like slowing down your thought processes. So you see things as they develop. So you're not always in this constant state of fight. Um, to me, that's been significant. Um, it's still work. You have to work on it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a daily, it's not a daily battle. It's a daily drill. It's a daily effort. <clears throat> and then the biggest piece I, I think with, with integration was just constant, constant recognition that you have to have some grace and forgiveness for yourself. Um, cause we will, we're going to, we're humans, right? We're going to make a mistake. You're going to come out of the medicine and you may be flourishing in life for a good three months. And then all of a sudden one of your habits kicks back in or one of your, one of your responses or, or your reactions kicks back in and then you punish yourself for it. You know, can you bounce back from that incidence and move forward again and give yourself some more compassion knowing that you made a mistake, but you didn't fall all the way back to where you were and you're still moving forward. Um, so the big one is like, just count the wins instead of the losses. And I think a lot of us grew up counting the losses way more than ever even looking at the wins because the losses and rightfully so the losses allowed us time to be self-critical and make corrections, but it didn't, it didn't allow us to sit and rejoice in the moment either. Yeah. It seems like for a lot of folks, they, they rely more heavily on that self-perfecting voice, right? They're looking at their life with, through these critical lenses what do I need to change? What do I need to get rid of? What do I need to fix so that I don't suffer anymore so that I can have better relationships? And I'm hearing you say that, uh, you know, it's not that this critical self-examination isn't important. It's really important, but it's got to be instead looked, looking, looked at through this lens of compassion, right. of acceptance. And I love the distinction between daily drills and daily battle. So I'm curious about what kinds of drills, you know, that might, what might fall into that category? What, what are you encouraging your folks to do? Uh, again, in this big container of self-compassion. Yeah, you know, the, the, the first one we, we talk about a lot is, is is good in and good out, vice bad in and bad out. You know, so, you know, good habits, good thoughts, good music, good food, um, good exercise, you know, bring the good things in, in, into, your, into your body and into your mouth and into your ears. Um, but then share those same things. So cutting out the negative talk, you know, the negative feedback, you know, the negative diet, the negative whatever it is has a long-term effect uh, and we know words matter. So it's being very conscious of the words that you choose to use and, and what they mean uh, and how you say them uh, was one meditation and mindfulness. You know, when I first started, you know, in this space, I couldn't meditate. I couldn't even sit still on a mat. Uh, I remember I went to a float tank and <clears throat> I, it was like within two minutes, like I just wanted to rip that, that machine or that room apart because I couldn't be alone with my thoughts. And actually getting to the time to the to the have the ability to sit still and just sit with yourself in thought and let the thoughts come 
uh, and not judge the thoughts, just sit with them, let them come in. Um, <clears throat> a lot of us were getting into meditation and then getting, and then getting mad at ourselves because we couldn't meditate. Right? Like it was something that I had to achieve right then and there. And, and it, that takes time. <clears throat> uh, we talk a lot about, you know, meditation is really just a single point of focus. You don't have to do it sitting cross-legged, you know, in the own position. You can do it hiking, biking, walking, surfing, you know, woodworking, painting. Uh, something that just allows your yourself to slow down and be in the moment uh, and with yourself. And then the other one is really taking time to know that you can love yourself. Like you can take care of yourself and not feel guilty for it. I think there's a lot of guilt when we, we carve out time for ourselves and just time to be alone. Uh, but then the other one was like, allow yourself to feel. And we're not used to feeling like we hide, we, you know, we suppress emotions, uh, but allow those emotions to come and sit with them. If you need to cry, cry, right? Uh, <clears throat> if you need to mourn, if you need to scream, do so. Uh, as long as you're not taking that on other people. And then the, the, a lot of the big one is allow the people in your life to know what's going on so that you have the grace and space to actually do those things that you need to do. Uh, and that And that just invites, you know, a lot more love and compassion in, into the circle that you're trying to enlarge in, right? Yeah, I mean, these are these are things that I think a lot of us struggle with, of course, especially military folks. Back to your points about, uh, you know, vulnerability. Uh, emotions are often viewed, especially the negative emotions, like sadness or fear, certainly mm -hmm. guilt, are viewed as these chinks in the armor where uh, the, the enemy can exploit. And, um, it's, it's really sobering to change our perspective on those particular things and no longer see them as vulnerabilities, not chinks in the armor, but actually, uh, like I've heard Reed describe as trailheads, right? If you feel emo an emotion, that's a signal that there's something that needs to be followed, followed down to something perhaps deeper. That if, as you're describing, you can really allow yourself to feel, then real healing can take place. Yeah, I really like that trailhead analogy. I'm going to keep that one, Reed. <laughs> And that one's yeah, there's something yours. too, you know, we, we've seen, <clears throat> you know, if you talk about the family unit, uh, especially in the military community, you know, the, the, the service members has this uh, persona, right, that's already been built up. And they come home with that persona. They live it. You know, they're, they're larger than life sometimes, and they, they drive everything, and they do everything, and they don't feel anything. I mean, we've had, you know, dozens and dozens of friends lost. <clears throat> we may cry at, at the memorial very briefly. But as soon as we leave that container, like all tears are gone, right? And you just go back into your life. <clears throat> and I've seen post-medicine, the way that I like to describe it, is now family members are getting to see, you know, their husbands or, or their fathers or their mothers or their, their, their wives exude all this emotion that they've never exuded before, right? And it's, it can be shocking and kind of unsettling to the family member or the partner. Um, as well. And just learning how to navigate that as, as that comes out too. What, what would you say to a family member? Um, because like you said, you know, people aren't coming home to a vacuum. They're coming home to, to families or communities who are used to seeing them a particular way. So, right. I mean, how much you coach a family member to uh, support one of these veterans coming home from a medicine session? So we, we try and work singularly with, with, you know, with the client and, and then if, if they want the partner, spouse or, you know, significant other coming at the dialogue, we'll talk to them as well. And we try not to do it where we're singling each other, each one out. And it's, it's hard. Some, some, I'll say family members or partners, you know, they're scared. You know, is my guy or girl going to come back and, and love me? Are they going to come back and leave me? Are they going to come back in one piece? You know, are they going to come back crazy or worse than they were? Uh, so there's a lot of extreme fear in there, and it's not their journey. So allowing them, you know, and, and help coaching them to, like, allow their partner to have their journey, to have their experience, and then even know that when they come home, they're not going to have all the answers right away. And they're still trying to piece it all together as well. You know, there's an anxiety that happens when you're the, the loved one on the other side. It's like I'm waiting for my partner or my, my person to get back is like, I want to hear it all. I want to hug you and I want to fix it and I want to move forward. And I want to hear all about it. <clears throat> and none of that's going to happen right away. And that's, it's a hard place to be in. 
Um, but they need to understand that that's going to happen. Um, and then just, you know, explain to them too, like, Hey, emotions are going to flow for a bit. Like you basically took a, a champagne cork out. Um, and it's going to bubble sometimes, you know, you may break down crying on the way to work. And that when those tears come, they're going to come whenever they come. Um, and allow them to happen. And it feels weird in front of your partner, specifically if, if you know, if, if you're the masculine one of the, in, in the relationship, it's like, oh, hold on, what do I do with all this right now? Right? Is this a safe place for me to be and, and a safe time for, to, do, to do this? Uh, and that's a challenging environment. Yeah, I like what you said earlier about uh, letting your partner know uh, or letting those around you, your supports know about the work you're doing and, and what it entails. I see that as such a key part of the preparation and integration, but I think we we sometimes understate the importance of preparation and kind of undershoot on the time really that would be ideal. But, but uh, I like this idea of... Uh, like unconscious contracts that we settle into, especially in our close relationship, but it's really uh, with anyone and just the default ways of being um, and how we communicate. And then someone goes and does uh, medicine and reconnects with their emotions, their their body, their spirituality. And that can be jarring for the the partnership, the the family. And um, And I just think it's so beautiful when people take a, a conscious and communicative approach of that saying like, listen, I want to share with you that, you know, as a result of this work I've been doing, you know, I didn't always, I realize now I didn't always tell the truth about how I feel, what I need. I didn't show my emotions. And, uh, you know, I've certainly experienced it after uh, ayahuasca um, experiences, especially my heart on my sleeve or tears close to the surface, like they are, they are there and it feels beautiful, but it's also um, uncomfortable at first. You're like, am I going to cry at the drop of a hat when someone asks me how I'm doing? <laughs> and uh, you know, that, that can be beautiful if we let it, right? Yeah. It, it, and all that's taken into account that we have support of family, right? Or, yeah. or a support, yeah. support of circle around us. You know, some, some, you know, members don't have that. And, you know, they, they've gone off and trying to heal themselves and reconcile and do the work that they need to do, knowing that they're going right back into a really sometimes negative environment um, and how to navigate that. Um, you know, whether there's religious connotations to it, which I've seen that Really, it's gotten so much better over the last couple of years um, <clears throat> in the understanding aspect of that. But just having a negative relationship, right? Uh, it's been hard. Yeah, that's that's a, such a good point, especially in in the kinds of PTSD we're talking about, where um, you know you may, may have been overseas for a very long time, or like you might not have had these a chance to even do these heart to heart conversations with your partner, or your family, uh, not to mention the toll that life and PTSD and everything else takes on our relationship. So yeah, I think it's a super important point of just um, what to do when there's not uh, like a loving, supporting group or partner or family to lean on. But uh, how do you help how do you help the people you work with through that? Is that where the community that that comes together, that you bring together, comes into play? Yeah, we try, we try and bring everyone in and, and and bring more people into the circle. So it, it's the same thing as when you go down for for integrations, right? Hey, I'm not the only one thinking this. You know, I'm not the only you know two people with the same issue that's happening. And how do we talk through these things? Um, and, you know, we found, you know, even when I was with the Mission Within and just a military spouse in general, like they take the back seat. <laughs> like they've taken the back seat for a very long time on, on almost everything. And, <clears throat> you know, for them of having to put up with a, a service member partner that's, you know, for the most part, hasn't been a nice person. Right. Hasn't been a good person. Hasn't been a loving person. They were when they met them <laughs> or they wouldn't have gotten that way. But over time, all that's eroded is like, all right, so can they trust that that person that they fell in love with that kind of turned into 
you know, Darth Vader for many years is now going to come back and be Luke Skywalker. And, and, and is he going to be Luke Skywalker for 30 days or is he going to come back to Darth Vader again? Right? And, and how, do, how do they trust that process um, and have faith in it? And that's and there's no promise. Right. It's it's a gamble. Um, but to really, you know, dive into that wholeheartedly and like, hey, I, I want to trust this process. But, you know, some, it's it's a hard one to uh, to work through. I'm glad you're speaking to this, Michael. I think trust in, in all aspects of this work is can be very, very difficult, right? We talk about trusting the process, trusting the medicine, trusting your your inner healing tendency, trusting the people around you, the facilitators. But yeah, this really important point of a person's family environment or their their immediate you know spouse or partner, um, they've had to go through a lot. You know they. Not only has their partner maybe been not so great, you know, they've also been gone a lot if they had a lot of deployments. And this other person is, like you said, left to take the back seat, maybe take care of, you know, children all by themselves and show up strong. So it adds layer of complexity that I'm glad you folks have an eye on. Um, I did want to quickly talk about something else I see in military members with PTSD, especially those who maybe haven't sustained physical injury. And that's something that some people refer to as moral injury. So, you know, I've seen this in drone operators. Uh, I've seen this in people who've gone down and they've, they've seen what they consider to be moral atrocities take place, maybe even participated in some of those moral atrocities. Imagine um, a lot of what you talked about before, this self-love and forgiveness it should be on tap for them. But uh, do you have any of your service members experience those types of traumas and, and how does medicine help them work through it? Yeah. And, and I did myself, I had a lot of moral, you know, injuries that I had to really reconcile with, you know, from my own personal life growing up, uh, to stuff that happened overseas, you know, death of children, you know, innocent civilians, um, operations gone wrong, <clears throat> you know, all that unfolds. I always like to say, you know, the battle, the, the mano a mano battle that took place, you know, two bad guys get on the field and may the best man win. Nothing came from that that was caused moral injury. He both kind of chose to be there and, you know, let, let that play out. It was the innocence, you know, the people that got, you know, caught between the two conflicts or just the, the repetition of it, of, of becoming numb. You know, when you first get, like I say, when you first get your game, when you're all excited and you kind of like, it, but after a while you just become numb uh, and you come home and you're numb. So you're dealing with the moral injury was probably, I feel like the biggest one, you know, at first we all thought it was combat trauma. Well, you had to separate the combat trauma into moral, moral, moral injury and then just taking someone's life, right? So working through that takes a long time um, and to be comfortable with it, but to know that you really just had to let that play out as well. You know, the medicine shows it to you a million different ways, but in the end, those people still die um, and you come home. And so how do you sit with that? Uh, and it's heartbreaking. I think that was the one that bothered people the most. You know, loss of loss of friends was a big one. Uh, but I didn't feel that that was as heavy as moral injury uh, across the board. Yeah, it makes makes total sense to me. And, and certainly it's consist consistent with some of my friends and some of the, the, the military veterans that I've treated. And uh, it seems like, Again, I just want to keep going back to your important point about self-love and forgiveness. There is something that about psychedelic medicines in particular that can allow access to that kind of love, that can allow perspective, that even if you view your behavior or what you experienced as unforgivable, right, um, that you can pass through that gauntlet and find grace uh, that is incredibly healing seems to be, and I'm sure it's capable, you know, oh, I know that it's possible outside of the psychedelic medicine context, but it seems to be something that is, that is on the menu with certain psychedelic medicines held in safe professional space with the, the supportive community that you're talking about that, um, that makes it, I, I would think, especially attractive to, to combat veterans. Yeah. I, you know, obviously we're in this space right now where, you know, psychedelics is, is pop back in the mainstream dialogue and, you know, a lot of people think it's a panacea. It's just this miracle drug or miracle <laughs> medicine that's out there. Right. It's not, you know, and it doesn't, it may not work for everyone. I like to call it, it's just the big rock mover. You know, most of us have been in therapy for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. 
dancing around a subject that we can't even get to because our egos and our body, our minds just won't let us get there. And where these medicines can come in is go, hey, I'm going to take you right to the X, my friend. You know, and then we're going to do some work. Um, but then coming out of that, knowing what you know, and for some somehow the medicine's able to show you the the way. It's like able to show you the path. It's like you can have all this if you do this, but you come out of it feeling it and knowing it. So you have a belief in yourself that you can actually enact it. Where I think if you sit around in therapy for years and years and years, you just can't conceptualize that feeling because it doesn't sink in, you know, deep enough. I came out of uh, when I came out of my Abigail, I had all this reconciliation, but I realized, oh, like over a couple of months, I was still very disconnected from my heart. Like I felt great about everything, and I had reconciled so much stuff. I still felt disconnected from myself and for other people. Um, and I'd leaned into ayahuasca and some some heart openers after that. <clears throat> and my whole my whole intent in going in that medicine journey was to be reconnected with my heart. And I got hit with like this this fire hose of love is what I call it, and just blasted me. It's, it's all I needed. This all I needed to one like. Okay, this is what love feels like. Yep, I trust it. <laughs> and I can share it and I can welcome it and I can hold on to it. Um, and I deserve it. Um, and I'm not scared of it. I think for a long time I was even just afraid of love, period, or afraid of the feeling of love, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, if that made any sense. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I would, before you shared it, I was going to ask how you, uh, how you went about that journey, because it's a big one, uh, reconnecting with the heart. But, but I like what you said as well about, uh, rock movers, these medicine as, as rock movers because, and as way showers as well. But, um, I view like my role in mental health and working with clients as, you know, working on helping identify and remove obstacles and not not doing the work for people right but uh if we can identify and uh, and remove uh move get rid of address the barriers to love the obstacles to giving and receiving love inside ourselves and help others to do the same there's some huge ripple effects of that kind of healing work for sure no, I agree. I think even the big thing is recognizing that there is an obstacle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in what form is that in? And how did it get there? Right? Who put it there? And and choosing and actually choosing to, to either move it or go around it, one of the two, right? Mm -hmm. Or through it. Yep. Yep. Well, Michael, um, is there is there anything else that you think our audience needs to hear? I think uh, you do have a very unique perspective. Like we st said at the top of the show, this is an underserved population of folks with some unique challenges. Um, anything with respect to the way, again, you prepare people, you sit with people, you help people integrate, or that's particular to the mission within? I think with respect to just the medicine itself is is that you know, we're on this very fast trajectory right now as everyone's trying to understand this, the, the space we're in um, and know that it's, you know, it can be a beautiful thing or we can really mess this thing up as, as we move forward. Um, you know, I mentioned, or we had connected before, you know, my daughter passed away last month. Um, opi opioids finally took her out. Oh no. And, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, and, uh, at a time when she was doing really well, right? And she got in pain and went to the street for uh, trying to find some Oxycontin and ended up getting Oxycontin with fentanyl. So, you know, then less than 12 hours later, she was dead. Uh, I had separated my relationship with her because of the addictions, you know, over 18 years ago. Like when you have an addict in the family, it went from care and compassion and mostly fear, right? How do I help this person? Until as the addictions continue on, it very quickly for me shifted into protection and anger, and now they're the enemy, right? Because they can affect or harm the rest of my family. And so for years, I just viewed my, you know, my daughter as the enemy, and I had, I viewed every addict as the enemy. And it took me until I came into the medicine space. <clears throat> 
to really understand that dynamic and how the meta, how those drugs, you know, the opioids can really get a hold of you. And once they do, is it's not your game anymore, right? It's not your choice. But really what was sitting on me for a long time was even right up to the when she passed was I had reconciled with her, but I still didn't have the compassion and love for her that I wanted, right, and, and that she deserved and I needed. Um, I just went into a medicine journey just uh, earlier on this month at the reservation, and that's what I asked the medicine for. I'm just like, I just, I want to love my daughter. Like, I want to sit with her. Um <clears throat> and love her. And I was able to do that, but I was able to guide myself into that journey, right? I was able to prepare myself for that. And, and, and even after, after the medicine journey to do my own integration. So you can do this alone, ideally not. Um, I, you know, even going into that, I shared with my friends, like, this is my intentions. This is my journey. This may be a rough journey for me. Um, But, you know, just please hold space and let me get through this. I've seen so much healing, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guys and girls, you know, through the medicines. Uh, I just went down to Kentucky uh, earlier this month to go speak at the uh, Abigail Commission there uh, to help, you know, use the money that came from the opioid settlement so that Kentucky can uh, treat addicts, you know, treat addictions with, uh, with Abigail. And there's a lot of more state initiatives going on right now. I, I really encourage people to see what's going on with them and get behind the data um, and kind of cut through all the chaff, the chaff that's out there. Because I think within this next year, two years, I think we can make some significant headway uh, into, you know, bringing the medicines mostly into the therapeutic realm, which is where I focus. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, a cosmonaut. I'm not trying to ex- expand my consciousness. I'm more about just helping people heal and, and reconnect to themselves. So, Hopefully we can make some headway in that. And I think the VA is finally getting somewhere with this, Mm -hmm. but hopefully just in the private sector in general. I mean, veterans aren't the only ones suffering. You know, they may have a a couple more added traumas that some people don't have, but the baseline traumas, I think we all share in common. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing about your daughter, for sharing about your personal experience Mm -hmm. overall. Um, Like we talked about before, I, uh, I, cer- I certainly can relate to some of what you said. I know that there are so many of our listeners who can relate um, and who are looking for this deep healing opportunity. We'll, we'll link to the Mission Within in our show notes for sure. Is there anything you want to tell people who uh, might want to look to that organization for help that they ought to know? Yeah, so the Mission Within, most of the organizations that I work with are in the veteran community. So missionwithin.org, uh, heroicheartsproject.org. Um, and then some of the other funding uh, organizations out there, Seal Future Foundation or um, Veterans Exploring Treatment uh, Solutions, typically funds in the veteran space. Uh, there's also Reason for Hope that's out there. We're trying to push policy across uh, at, the, at the state and federal level. I so work with and support and advocate for the Veterans Mental Health Leadership uh, Coalition, working at the state level as well, trying to educate and advocate uh, for psychedelics. Um, yeah, and that's it. just it. Check out the websites, check out what's out there and um, kind of get smart. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, you know, I was looking forward to this conversation and, and all the things you've done and been involved with, but really what, uh, what I'm taking away from it is uh, just how, how like palpable the work is that you're doing and how sincere and, and well-intended and, and uh, you know, I can really, uh, I can really feel the the good coming out of it. And uh, even across this, uh, this video screen. So I'm, I'm touched and inspired by, by what you're, what you're doing. And thank you for sharing it with us and, and the people you, you help. Uh, Thank you much. Both of you guys very much. Thank you. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous, a mental wellness company committed to tackling the global mental health crisis by delivering best-in-class psychedelic-assisted therapies, contributing to the body of primary and clinical psychedelic research, and fostering healing through community connection and social responsibility. 
You can learn more about Numinous at Numinous.com. That's N-U-M-I-N-U-S.com. If you enjoyed the show today and you want to support us, here's how you do it. Rate and review the show on platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Subscribe to the Numinous YouTube channel. Like the videos and share it. Share the show or clips of the show with someone that you think will enjoy it. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Consult with a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.